You're listening to Big Blend Radio's Toast of the Art Show. We are airing live from the historic Homestead Inn in beautiful 29 Palms, California. Check it out. Go to the website. It's 29in.com. And while you're online, because you're online listening, right, unless you downloaded this, go to markspangenbergfineart.com, and that's S-P-A-N-G-E-N-B-E-R-G, markspangenbergfineart.com. Awesome, awesome art, and we're very mm-hmm. excited to have him join us here. He is based in 29 Palms, so he's around the corner, but of course we can't do this in person because we, we, we're not allowed to cough on each other <laughs> with oh, this nice. virus going on. He's a fine artist, and he's also a muralist, a contemporary realist, a portrait artist, and uh, very excited to have him join us on the show. So welcome, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Lisa? No, oh, doing good, and Nancy's here too, and she's Hello, behaving. Nancy. I'm, I'm, I'm not behaving. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, as Jerry, you know, Jerry here at the Homestead Inn says, it's a beautiful day in the desert. Mm-hmm. Isn't it awesome with all the wildflowers? Oh, yes, it is. It's uh, pretty amazing. I can imagine what it's going to look like in a week. I yeah. know. I know. We might get a little drop of rain today, believe it or not. I don't think so but i don't know it doesn't look like it but you can never tell. you never you can never tell in the desert right? right so you were born and raised here yes it was wow right on yeah, right on cool. and so i know you went to north carolina for a stint as well but it looks like you've traveled all over with your art as you know but this area i to me this this has like a whole bunch of art going on it seems like it's an art like an artist community not only is uh, all the public art here but it's like a community of artists. Yes, it is. There's um, there is quite a few in different styles, and uh, anyway, I am w- involved with the Twin Moms Art Gallery, mm-hmm. and with the Morongo Basin Art uh, Association, and yeah, it's pretty amazing how many artists we have. Hmm. Uh, the one that get uh, well on the tour, almost to 200 or or so. Wow. We do have a tour in October. Oh, and that's through the Morongo Basin, so that like includes Joshua Tree, Yucca Valley, and Morongo yeah. Valley, right? Yes, and Wonder Valley. Yeah, what's in going Wonder on Valley. with Wonder Valley? Wonder Valley seems to be like a, a going up with art, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're probably familiar. I don't know. Well, most people are, uh, are probably not familiar with the uh, Glass Outhouse, which uh, has a four-year <laughs> waiting list to get in. It's a. Really? It's amazing. She does not advertise or anything. That's funny. And she has to be wow. else, you know, taking care of her Facebook page and all this. And it's like wow. a, I had to wait four years, and they called me up two months before my show, which was uh, let's see, yeah, March last year. Oh, I can't remember because wow. years are flying by. But <laughs> and uh, oh, Mark, you have a show in uh, in a month. Are you ready? I says. Oh, I forgot. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting place to visit ah, if you haven't been there. It, it's, we looked online, and, you know, it, there was a, a bed and breakfast house I stayed in, and I think it was in Fallbrook up in the mountains, where the bathroom was completely glass, but you were perched on this mountainside. And so people could see in if they wanted to climb up the mountain and hang from a tree somewhere. <laughs> Nice, <laughs> but yeah, but otherwise, you, it was quite private. But it was kind of a funny feeling to, yeah. I mean, even like part of the floor, you could see down through the glass, and so you're just like, man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hope you're not nobody's playing a little joke on you, and actually you can see in. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's the with, yeah, that's a, you know that's what it was named after. They had this. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a glass outhouse with the uh, one way glass, fortunately. Oh, okay, so that's oh. good. That's a yeah. You can't fog up the windows. Nobody yeah. could, I suppose. <laughs> uh oh, it's Friday. <laughs> Anything could be said here, you know. But didn't like you, if artists like Bev Doolittle lived here, and you know, so there's mm-hmm. like, you know, it's pretty amazing. And and just I think having all the murals and and then all the you know sculptures and metal art is really cool too now you're you do murals you do portraiture then you also studied fresco uh, painting so let's start at the beginning did it start with a sketchbook or did it start with painting well i well it probably started with drawings um you know my mom was a journalist for the desert trail and uh, there was oh. five five of us well, 
time when I was born, it was just three, and then, and then there's four, and then five. But anyway, uh, basically, my mom would say, uh, you know, don't bother me. I have a deadline, and hand us here. Here's newspaper, newsprint, which you had plenty of, and uh, here's a pencil. Go in this room and entertain yourself. So and that's how it started. And I remember sitting in the, uh, I was in the bedroom with my sisters drawing on the floor, and I, I think I drew a horse. Uh, I don't know what it was. I think it was, you know, a sun or something. And my sisters. Uh, Ran ahead and show it to my mom and says, "Look what Mark did." I think it was like four or five then, but I can remember remember that. I think that's where it started. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, of course, you know that's how we, you know, I would, you know, we would entertain ourselves, uh, either drawing or you know, just mainly playing outside. Also, you know, back then we didn't have TV or any of that, any of those distractions, so we had to. Basically, you know, get out of the house and uh, don't come back till dinner, dinner time. Mm. And uh, so we had to be kind of creative. Uh, we had plenty to have creative with. We had plenty of rocks and build forts and sticks and plenty of acreage to run around in like uh, wild men. <laughs> you see, but I think there's something about being out in nature and having that kind of upbringing that does, like you're saying, bring out the creativity in you, you know, and and I think, you know, even now when you look at everyone being sheltered in place, we're seeing, mm-hmm. you know, musicians or, you know, they're, you know, as hard as it is right now because they can't go do gigs and things, you're seeing more creativity, I think. Just looking around what's happening on Facebook with live streams and for artists, I think there's a, you've got to you got to do something constructive, so you might as well be creative, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. And go for it. Yeah. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. You seem to have several different styles. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, because most artists lock into a style and, and kind of go with that. But, you know, mm-hmm. I'm looking at your paintings and I see some of the old master styles in there, like, especially the lighting from Rembrandt. And I, I like different, you know, it, I'm like, well, now it would go to another painting. It's totally different. And it, so most artists don't seem to do that. What What led you to doing different styles like that well i kind of enjoy you know going from one medium to the next you know the challenge Mm -hmm. of it and um you know drawing was the first um got me got me going uh let me jump ahead well you know of course you know through grades grade school and whatnot um i you know i kind of gravitated towards the visual arts and I remember mm-hmm. in third grade, well, I'd be, you know, that we'd have like a, this is, I went to Blessed Sacrament for eight years. That you know, was a Catholic school. We had these uh, nuns from, fresh from Sligo, uh, Ireland. And uh, and I remember in third grade, I'd be, I ended up with almost dictate the mural job. You know, there'd be so many assigned, and uh, I ended up basically becoming the, you know, the main dictator and completing the job. And I remember they'd give little awards out, and uh, I remember one of the nuns saying, you know, uh, I, I can't remember where they gave us, um, you know, a rosary or a, you know, a holy card or something. She was, and she said, well, okay, for art, I mean, you know, Mark Spangenberg wins this award. And, you know, you had that Irish bro, and she goes, well, Mr. Spangenberg, I think this is your calling. I got a feeling this is your calling. And <laughs> from third grade, I kind of like, Yes, that's wow. right. I think it is, and uh, you know, from there, you know, I, you know, I just like there's something about, uh, you know, where the pencil gave way to the texture of the paper or what mm. paint would do, mm. and you know, you, you know, starting out, you know, as a kid, you're, you know, basically playing and fantasizing you're an artist and just, you know, um, doing whatever and. Of course, your mom's putting, you know, the your picture on the refrigerator, and you know that's great. You're getting recognition, mm-hmm. and uh, but finally there was a point where I think it was you know, early in high school where I was like, you know, I really need, you know, I want to go further, and I wasn't quite, you know, it's you have one hour. I did take art art 
uh, classes, you know, it was one hour of, you know, in the, maybe mm-hmm. in a week. And it was, I think it was like a Thursday from a Don Malone. And it was just, wasn't enough. Mm. And, but always in the background too was find something, you know, your parents and others were, you know, you need to find some more private goals so you can make a living, et cetera. And, you know, I was, you know, I did construction and, uh, of course, I said, well, you know, find a, you really need to find a career to fall back on. You know, so, you know, the only thing I knew was the National Park Service here. So uh, my first two years, uh, when I left uh, home for college, I was down in college in the desert. I was a natural resources management major with the thought of, okay, I'd like to get into the National Park Service. And my first job out of high school uh, was here as a, as maintenance, and I discovered that maintenance got out into the park more than the rangers did. The rangers had to decipher, you know, the verbiage that was coming in from Washington, and they were more preoccupied with that. I mean, that's the way I imagined it, whereas uh, at that time, Joshua uh, wasn't that popular with Joshua National Monument. Hmm. And uh, they would just give me a key, you know, say, okay, here's your assignment. Mark, uh, take the truck. Um, the rangers, you know, the law enforcement rangers on the east side or the west side. Do you have any problems pertaining where you're going to need them? Um, you know, you have to get the radio. I'd be out by myself and I'd do a list of, you know, maintenance duties. And anyway, um, you know, like, you know, I really enjoyed it. I loved the, you know, I loved the park and the park mm-hmm. service. So I thought, well, okay, this, is, this will be great. Anyway, um, Time went on, I graduated, and then I, my next assignment was uh, I got a job in northeastern New Mexico, Capitol Mountain hmm. uh, National Monument, which is an extinct volcano, right in the corner, middle of nowhere. When I got there, I was like, I was 21. I was like, oh, my God, what I did? I'm like, I'm 30 miles from the nearest town. <laughs> <laughs> like, no but, shenanigans uh, happening now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, about, you know, on my second year, and then, I was there for two years, and then uh, as a seasonal, and then you know I came back home. I was doing, I did everything, uh, you know, back at Joshua National Park, dispatching, and on top of that, between seasons, I was you know doing construction, uh, oh, hanging sheetrock, and, um, and I said, well, this is not going. And then of course, a, a superintendent actually told me, he says, Mark, he says, I have to tell you this, but there's been changes in D.C. And as far as getting into the park service, it's going to be a long shot for you. Because it kept oh. drawing, you know, falling further down. Because, you know, veterans coming back from Vietnam, and they got, for you know, points, extra points mm-hmm. on the tests and whatnot. And I just, so anyway, I said, well, you know, and I don't want to be in construction all my life. I'd see these, you know, I was working in Palm Desert, Orange County, whatnot, hanging five-eighths, 12-foot sheets by myself, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, in, down in Palm Desert, Palm Springs, you only could, at that time, they had an ordinance, you only could um, work construction in the off-season, which meant it was the summertime. It was 126 degrees. And I said, boy, I'm not going to do this all my life. i got to think mm-hmm. something else. So mm-hmm. it was always, you know, always gravitated towards art. Mm-hmm. And at nighttime, I would take courses. Of course, at COD, my minor was, you know, I took art courses also. And um, I'll relate this little story how I got to learn fresco painting uh, See, that's, <laughs> to my fres- surprise. I, I do wanted to ask you about that because fresco painting, uh, you know, the first thing I'm like, it's oh, fresco. No, but um, just what, can you explain what fresco painting is? Because I know it's, it's interesting what you do in regards to you're doing murals, you're doing portraits, and then, you know, there's very, to me, some of your paintings, you know, Nancy and I talking about, like it's, it's reminds me of Rembrandt style and you know it's I love your art I think you know you've got this cool like here here, it's realist but it's got that emotion and that feeling and that blending in it that I dig like Nancy's wildlife is kind of like that I love it I I mean Nancy and I were going through it's like wow man but you hit it dead on with this you know this is not a photograph people and it's not digitally replicated yeah (laughs) it's real 
it's got texture to it, you know, uh, yet can be so fine as well. Like, you know, some of the portraits, like this, you know, the skin is so fine, and yet at the same time it has that texture, which is amazing to have that balance. But fresco painting is something you don't really hear about that often, and we do a lot of interviews about art and artists, um, but fresco, you just, we don't hear that much, I don't think. You really don't. Well, actually, it's very demanding. It's a, it's a, you know, you're going to have a, usually have a crew to help you to assist, and mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's expensive uh, to have one produced. What you're dealing with, of course, it's it's in the fresh plaster. Well, it pay probably it takes about maybe two years preparation time. First, you have okay, you're in the painter uh, commission to say okay, want this fresco on this wall and all right well you're also sometimes working with um oh structural engineers you know or the uh, you know on the building site where you know because that's gonna be a lot of weight hanging on the wall you got mm. probably about an inch or an inch and a half of plaster hanging there when it's finally completed and then of course you have to use fresh line uh aged line you know from your scratch coat brown coat and then your final, uh, your painting mm-hmm. coat. And um, so anyway, the first coat, yeah, you let, usually what they do, let it set for six months. Of course, you're just going to have cracks, and they go fill the cracks in. You have you hire a plastering crew. And then, uh, then there's, of course, the second coat. And it's the same thing. You let it age for a while, it'll settle. And the final coat, which is, a, you know, uh, which you're going to paint into as it uh, is setting up. There's a point where the uh, the plaster that you have uh, put on is about maybe a quarter inch thick of that, hmm. and uh, of course you have you have large cartoons, you know, the drawings of the work you're going to uh, you transfer which you transfer on to the uh, wall. Um, mm-hmm. You know, using you know a pounce bag, which is um, you know, okay. You perforate you perforate the you know holes in the uh, the drawings, the, the scale drawings, and, um, <clears throat> and then you put put that over put the paper over the uh, area you're going to paint for that day. And uh, of course, you take the pounce bag and it has uh, maybe a red pigment in there. And usually, and then, of course, the, you know, the pigment goes through the dots. You have this dot pattern. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and from there, you, uh, okay, that's before you put the, the final plaster on, actually. And mm-hmm. then um, you take your you know, this is, uh, distilled water in the pigment. Uh, you know, like I said, it's a red pigment, maybe, uh, oh, Um, burnt, uh, burnt, uh, burnt sienna, mm-hmm. and um, okay, you outline the uh, the area you're gonna paint that day, and you only have maybe from five to twelve hours to do that painting in a day oh. to finish the painting. Once you put the final coat of plaster over there. Wow, and, and of course you know you, of course the plaster goes on, where you perforated, and then, um, then of course then you put the uh, drawing over it again, and then you do the dot pattern again over the. Wow, uh, hmm. you know the lines of the, uh, the object that you're going to paint her. So anyway, and there's other people they're grinding pigments for you and keeping the, let's say of course everything. Is preparatory before, uh, so you're mm-hmm. making uh, sample color sample boards, which is in plaster for the colors that you're, you're going to use from wow. another painting you have done earlier. So you're you're doing this drawing and painting maybe six times before you're finished. Wow, and you have so a time limit. You have a time limit for the, a section, and then you'll stop. Okay, let's say well we're going to do. Um, Let's say you have a couple of figures, and you say, well, we'll we're going to just do the face and the hair today, and then we'll 
you know, these two people, and then we'll do their clothing tomorrow. Wow. So anyway, then you you do that, and then you then you come back, and hopefully the uh, pigments to go right into the blaster, because uh, lime can be very temperamental occasionally. Because there there are many times uh, frescoes that I uh, assisted on where we had to basically scrape all that plaster off and start all over again. Oh. Go back wow. to you know ground one, and you just mm. go okay. All right, it took it took right. All right, we can go on to the next phase. Yeah. And if you have to take it down, I'd be like, give me mm. the wine. <laughs> that's yes, awesome. there's plenty. Of, there was plenty of that. I'll have to admit. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's complicated. I painted a, a swimming pool um, mm-hmm. before they put the water in, and yeah. I um, the person who owned the pool he's a contractor, and he just brought the paints and said, here, use these. I'm like okay, and um, I painted a mermaid and a bunch of fish and coral. Um, yeah, and coral and stuff, and it was kind of fun. And then when they filled the water up, I was like, uh oh. <laughs> what was different. that? Acrylic paint, sir? Yeah, just acrylic. Oh, yeah. And it came with, there was, <laughs> yeah, there's no special preparation at all. And I, you know, then we left the country. And um, this was when we were living in um, South Africa. And so I never really knew how, if it faded or if it peeled or if mm-hmm. the preparation was correct because there really wasn't any. It was just the swimming You'd pool. bump your head, though, because yeah, it, was it was very 3D with the water. And when you'd oh, go crazy. down, it was almost like snorkeling. And people would bump their heads on the bottom of the pool. Yeah, because they like I painted the tops of crabs on the bottom of the pool. And then when yeah. you did the sides, it was a different look but the mermaid was pretty funny because she looked different depending on how busy the pool was <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how to take that but <laughs> I, well if i don't I, I had a bunch of comments and i'm behaving myself but this is but yeah dude when you're doing murals like versus fresco the murals you know that's got especially when i look at like 29 palms the high desert i mean when it's bright it's damn bright it's like hello Wakey, wakey, yeah. everybody. God's light is on. <laughs> it's shining on you, and it is super bright when it decides to, you know, shine. It's it's there. So do you have to prepare for that, in, and would it be different in another location because of the light? Oh, are you talking about fresco or are you talking about regular murals? So most of my regular murals mur- were all, all, in, all indoors, have been all indoors, private houses, oh. some bus- in businesses and whatnot. Mm. Um Mostly like furniture, the furniture business because I was involved too. One of my other jobs was I worked for a company where I was striping and painting on mm. furniture. And mm. um, so anyway, and their connections. Of course, everybody was in the furniture, and I ended up. You know, that's where I'd be getting my jobs. Well, mainly got my jobs through uh, interior des- designers. Yeah. Uh, they mm-hmm. were kind of the catalyst because I could probably, and it's just you know. Uh, when you're you walk in somebody's private home, uh, they need that confidence because you know some people, oh yeah, I can paint, and all of a sudden you see this, oh my gosh, he wants me <laughs> to pay him. But uh, you know, where the, the interior designer is the catalyst of confidence in some way. She goes, oh yeah, or he, uh, yeah, Mark, yeah, he, he'll he's good at this, and he's what you want because you could go in and show your portfolio of all your work. Mm. And still they're mm. going to be, oh, I don't know about that. I, can you really paint this? Can you paint, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. my dogs. I don't see any dogs in your portfolio. I see horses, it's, cats, and uh, other stuff. But, uh, but yeah. can, you, you know, can you paint a dog? I'm like, That's so funny. <laughs> That's what no, it's just the way. It's just it's human nature. You know, they're going to lay but down Nancy some money. had that. Yeah. Nancy had that in South Africa. She did a tour with her Art for the Cancer Association and would, would paint in public. Which isn't always the... That's not that much fun. No, <laughs> but if she was painting, like, I remember at one stage she painted Rottweilers for, like, a month. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. she would get one commission after the other, because, and then people thought she could only paint Rottweilers. Rottweilers. It wouldn't be... Like, can you paint a chihuahua? Yeah. You know, and but it's then, a smaller dog. Yeah, and then you'd have chihuahuas for the next two weeks, and then, you know, it would be like, oh, I'm so sick of doing chihuahuas. But Mark, Mark, this is interesting, you know, because looking at how, you know, some of the, the classical style of painting, like, have you 
did, have you ever had the inclination, or have you done it? Like said, okay, I'm going to paint Mona Lisa or something like that. Like I'm going to do my version. <laughs> well, what I've done, I mean, when I was, you know, just to study to see what the, you know, what the, what did the artist do, or mm-hmm. you know, making studies. That's pretty common where you look at a master's copy, and you actually yes. you can go in some museums. You can, you know, you can permission and. You can sit there, you know, stand in front of an actual painting and copy it. You'll, I'm sure you've seen that where you've walked mm-hmm. in, um, you know, a museum mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they're painting a rube, you know, copying a rube. And that's, you know, I've done that just to see, okay, here's the technique. What did he do? There's something I like in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I've done, let me see, gosh, of course, every, you know, every, you know, kind of, yeah, I did gravitate towards, uh, you know, I did Rembrandt, Velasquez, mm. and mm. Morello, and yeah. uh, others. Like, there's so many mm. that are just, you know, out of this world back then. Oh, my gosh, Car- and the, you can go back to the Renaissance. These guys were like almost kids. Mm. <laughs> They're <laughs> amazing, though. Work. And, yeah. and what, what is the, I mean, when you think back to the the tools and then, the lighting, the paint, like you think at night, right? They didn't have electricity, so they'd have lanterns. And if they were up late paint. at night, you make their well, own actually, paint. Well, actually, mostly during the day, you know, your daylight mm-hmm. hours. Yeah. And uh, I know, you know, there's quite a few artists, too. They still, you know, traditionalists, you know, maybe out of the uh, academies out of Florence and other. Of course, now there's more, the attrition, tradition, more traditional uh, uh, academies, art academies now than there were. Mm-hmm. Uh, hmm. Gosh, they didn't, they didn't really didn't have many when I was, you know, still exploring and looking. Hmm. And uh, there's a lot of artists. Yeah, that's all they use is, is you know, okay, the the north light. Uh, they'll have a uh, skylight, you know, and controlling the light, natural light, mm-hmm. in their studios. If you walk in, I and it'll be really dark because they'll what they'll do they'll paint the uh, walls maybe a neutral kind of greenish. You know, so the light won't be bouncing all over the place, <laughs> and then they'll be, you know, of course, pl- placing their model or still life, you know, in controlled lighting, natural lighting, and there's a difference. There is a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there yeah. is. No, natural light to me is it just even in, I don't know. Yeah, it, to me, it, you're, it's it's nature, right? And so you're defying nature when you're not using it. But then is it different, like, using live models versus here's your stick or your photograph, you know, to oh, paint from? Photographs. <laughs> photographs, uh, well, you know, a, you've probably seen, I was a billboard painter for a mm. while. That's what I, you know, first uh, left Art Center. I was in Art Center after a while. I went into Art Center when I was 27. And I, said, I built up a portfolio, was helped, and uh, the get a portfolio to get in there and I was surprised to get in there because uh, I knew I needed more training especially drawing uh, when mm-hmm. I was in Salzburg you know, fresco painting I was like oh man I, uh, I'm, my uh, drawing skills oh they're terrible and I would really even kind of really <laughs> prove it I, by happenstance I walked into a an art show of uh, Gustav Klimt's drawings it, and it was called a really small type on this door it says art you know german art art show gustav you know five thousand drawings and it, it's like the side of a cave almost and i walked in it's going and the guy goes you know the gentleman goes oh, come in it's the art show come on you know you know here i was with these incredible drawings i was like boy i need to i really need training so that gave me inspiration to uh, really work mm-hmm. hard and uh, find a decent school. And I chose Art Center because, you know, it's here. And uh, it's probably mm-hmm. the best one to go to, you know, in this area at that time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, it was commercial. It was commercial art mainly. You know, mm-hmm. most of my uh, instructors were painting, um, you know, the – Movie posters you saw everywhere, those incredible, like, you know, mm. Raiders of the Lost Ark post- oh, cool, posters cool. and... Yeah. Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
uh, Drew Strutzen, um, Craig Nelson, and I had Bern Hogarth, who was a, this is where I learned to use pen and ink. He taught me to use pen and ink. Mm. Um, Bern Hogarth, he did the Tarzan comic strips in the 30s and 40s. He did the inking. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know. Pen and ink is neat. That I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't have thought of you doing pen and ink, because it, I just, yeah, I mean, you seem to touch to every part of art, you know. But the one thing too, I want to know about doing TV courtroom sketches. Did yeah. you oh. like O.J. Simpson or what? <laughs> no, O.J. Simpson. Of course, I was in L.A. I was in North Carolina. Uh, I did. I would get a call. Well, I'll tell you my first my first courtroom uh, experience. Well, you know my, the billboard. You know when the the um, electronic revolution happened, it really wiped out. Of course, they didn't need billboard painters anymore. Mm. And of course, you know the printing changed the improvements yeah. in printing, mm-hmm. where they could get these large billboards done in you know a fraction of the time would take a billboard painter, and they didn't have to pay them insurance or anything. And uh, so anyway. You know, same thing was happening in Hollywood and everything else. And so I was like, well, and I remember I flew out when all this happened. I was like, my friends here that were doing well, like in Hollywood, doing, uh, you, know, all, you know, movie comps and stuff. And they're saying, don't come out here because we're looking all, there's 50,000 of us looking at the same job. So we're all like wondering what to do. And there's a lot of a well-known artists that was like selling all their assets because it was like, well, there's no more work. What are we going to do? I'm going to oh, retool wow. and figure it out. But anyway, that happened to me, and I just and I went back. I said, you know, I'm going to stick it out here. I said, Otherwise, if I had to move here, I'd have to I'd basically wipe out my uh, account just getting uh, reestablished, you know, rent, everything mm-hmm. else that, when you make a big move. So I was just like, oh, wait a minute. Well, I always take a sketchbook in with me, you know, bars everywhere, coffee shops or whoever, and drawing people. I says, you know what? Oh, I'm going to go to the t- local TV stations. And I remember going, and I, you go to see the reception. I says, oh, I'd like, you know, I, you know, I, I do, I do uh, courtroom drawings, <laughs> which was a <laughs> lie. And I just said, well, do you have any work? Oh, I says, oh, you know, I did a few in California. This is you know, I don't like through my teeth, but I needed work. And uh, I said, well, uh, you know, I sold stuff that I, I produced in Los Angeles. And when I did get work, and I says, I, but I have my sketchbooks. And she said, well, can I look at them? You know, those are the receptionists at the desk. And I said, she says, well, I'll, you know what? I'll Xerox these. And I'll, uh, you know, uh, put them on the... Uh, News director's desk. And I said, okay. And I was like, oh, shoot, now I'm going to pay for this. I figured nobody was going to call. And I get this call like a month later saying, oh, we need you. This is, uh, I can't remember her name, but so-and-so at uh, Fox News. And uh, can you be at the um, federal courthouse down at, uh, you know, downtown Greensboro? And you're going to meet with uh, uh, Frank Buckley. And uh, he's going to be your reporter you got to meet with. And he's going to, you know, the courtroom was really small. This is a really old courtroom. And uh, so there, could, there wasn't too many people. And I mean, it was uh, Diane Sawyer versus Food Lion. No way. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And um, so I went in and, you know, I was like, oh, gosh. And then the thing is, though, <laughs> you think, oh, yeah, this is going to be just like a you walk in like I you know, walk in a bar or a coffee shop, well you know, you sit down, you're relaxed. And you see these people looking at you, you see like maybe on the LA, New York, Chicago news people and they're looking at you because you're the only <laughs> one and maybe one other reporter that can go in that courtroom and all of a sudden, boy, the butterflies in your it is in your gut. <laughs> and I was oh, like man. and I learned learned the lesson too. And uh, you walk in, and I says, "Oh shoot, now I'm gonna face this." I says, "I didn't know who who the players were," because he says, "I want this lawyer here." I was like, uh, "Okay."
like, hey, this guy, here. oh, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, if you can't get you know, the high end, and then, okay, here's a guy from Food Lion. And I was like, okay, do what you did in your life. I says, well, anything else? Just do what you did in Los Angeles. I says, okay, I'll do it. And I, I tell you, that pencil felt like it was 25 pounds. And, uh, Did you sweat? I mean, my fingers would sweat. I would have hand sweat. I was, you know, the adrenaline. You like I said, when you're walking in, the adrenaline just shot up, and I was like, oh, that, that was the hardest part, but the first one because you know you get that under control. But I learned to go in like a half hour earlier, and just mm-hmm. start drawing, to get all that energy out, just to get that yeah. adrenaline where it comes to focus. down. Yeah, and, and get uh, cozy on the bench. The bench yeah, and the people me. used to seeing me too. You know, was, you know, okay, you know. Um, so, and there were some mm. terrible, you know, crimes. Uh, there was one I was on for two weeks. I was in Fayetteville for two weeks, and it was it was a really brutal murder, and I won't go into all the details. But yeah, no, no. I and being when you're in the court, you. You concentrate more, and you're in there for a long time, sometimes a long time, depending on, you know, what's what evidence is being uh, shown. And, uh, oh, boy, yeah, you see, and then I, I remember when I got through the whole thing, I had this attitude for a month or more, and I remember walking to the coffee shop I used to uh, frequent, and there was these deputies sitting around, and I said, oh, I says, i got to ask you guys a question. Oh, go ahead, what do you, yeah, I says, you know, I'm courtroom drawer and I said I was in this this court you know this murder trial everybody was following and uh, and I says you know I had this I just had this attitude is that normal and the guy goes oh we're familiar with that yeah we're familiar with that case he says if you didn't have an attitude after that he says you'd be a cold-blooded psychopath <laughs> says, oh, oh, wow. guys I'm glad I'm nor- I guess I'm normal he says yeah you are don't worry if oh. you're okay <laughs> yeah, you know, that's got to be, like, mm-hmm. crazy because you're also on the spot and having to catch the action. And it's, yeah. like, zone in, and, and then it's, like, the personality, get the person. You know, it's it's interesting because even, you know, there's also the drawings where you have to tell someone you've seen somebody do something and then explain it and someone draws from what you're telling them. That's, like, that's got to be difficult. Yeah, and then you're you know. sitting, you're there, you're watching um... – and here comes the forensics guys, and you're hearing this. See, the longest it was about six hours in a courtroom, and you're, and there was where I was locked in, and the reporter was locked out because the judge decided, well, we got to do this some more. And you're seeing, every, believe, believe me, all the, you know, all the photographs they take of the body. Oh every, no. Everything, oh. you know, all those bruises here, and these guys, the prison guys, are just kind of like. Uh, it's kind of like talking to an engineer. It's like, oh, yeah, and it's, you know, it's got X amount of centimeters, and this photo here, this slide, you're seeing the slide as big as the wall. And wow. uh, then, uh, and uh, fortunately, the family of the victim is not in there. But when the family comes in and you're hearing them, there's a point, too. It's like, if you screw up, you, you might as well figure you're never going to work again for another year or two. So you're, the hardest mm-hmm. part for me was, and I was told this, I called up uh, um, uh, Mr. Robles. He did the Manson um, trial. Oh. And I said, yeah. He says, well, there's a point, too. Is you get, you know, you've got to fight your emotions. Otherwise, you're gonna, you'll gonna you'll be shot. So I said, okay. He says, yeah, you get, that's the hardest part. So I took his advice, and it was tough. There's a point where you're ready to. <laughs> Sometimes you want to cry because what you've seen and heard, and mm-hmm. then the family members, you know, they're behind you. You can't see them, and you're, you know, hear them crying or and whimpering or whatever. You know, the mother and the grandmother, and and you just you know the person's whole life. And mm-hmm. that's the hardest part. That was the hardest yeah. uh, mountain to climb and get over. And uh, somehow I managed because there were some other court martyrs. They walked out of the. They were gone. They went out. They were crying. They left. Never came mm. back again. And, of mm. course, you know, I got to sell. I was fortunate. I was able to sell my drawings to those other TV stations because they, they were kind of shortchanged. Wow. And, you know, what, a, what, a, what a wild ride. 
I mean, when you yeah. think about this, Mark, I mean, you're up on billboards, then you're, you know, doing a fresco, and, you know, in inside, out, I mean, it's crazy, <laughs> in a good way, yeah, I mean, yeah. in a good way. I mean, if you're going to do art, you might as well do all these different parts of it. I wanted to ask you in closing, I was hungry. When you think <laughs> you're hungry, I know, I know. When you say yeah, alfresco, oh, okay. when, when if you're gonna sit down with a, a bottle of wine and an artist from the past, who would or now, who would you want to sit down with, artist-wise, that you haven't met, I and haven't have met. a bottle of wine with? You know, it doesn't I have would, to be wine. <laughs> well, it would be wine. Um, I would sit down with my grandfather. I never knew he died when he was forty. It was when my mom was ten, or yeah, ten. He was mm. he was an artist. He he was sent right after World War One. He was in the German army, and of course, you know, suffered all these years in the trenches. And, uh, and of course, then his you know my grandmother she died from the influenza in 1920. Uh, Whoa. 22. Yeah, because my mom was 18 months old. Yeah, then, and of course, you know. That was his the love of his life. I was told, and you know, everybody told me. My aunt, who was 15 years my mother's senior, told me, "Well, yeah, he died of a he died of a broken heart," and uh, which now is proven. Uh, people do mm-hmm. die of broken broken hearts, but uh, I had the good fortune. Uh, I went to Germany with my parents along with my brothers when I was 17, and I actually met people that knew him. There were, I remember this one woman that was, but of course she was very old because, um, but she knew knew him, and she was, of course she spoke in this dialect, and her son had to translate into German to my mom, and my mom would turn it to in English, and it was like I just heard all these inc- good things about him, and there was a when we were hiking in the woods, there was this uh, organization called uh, the Vonder Tog. You know, it was international wandering, and you're hiking in the woods, and I'm walking. This gentleman, older gentleman, goes, "Oh, you know, you, you seem to be from America." He says, "Yeah, what are you doing here?" And I says, "Well, we're visiting my mom's." He says, "Well, who?" When he, and I says, "Well, my, you know, grandfather Carl Bender." And he goes, "Carl Bender? Oh, he taught me how to play the clarinet because he was also a musician." Oh, and wow. uh, so you hear this. I know you started telling me all these wonderful things, and I saw his artwork, a uh, memorial in a train station to the fallen in uh, World War One and stuff like. You know, he's a classically trained. And then just from stories, my aunt would tell. She was kind of like our, our kind of like our grandmother that we didn't have. Hmm, and wow. uh, so I was like, so I was like, well, yeah, I'd like to, you know talk to him you know yeah, yeah, I would like to have a discussion with him and then plus he was asked to come to this country to paint murals in Vermont in Italian churches they were building you know the wood there were all the stone cutters up there oh wow and they were building churches and I think it was, there was a cousin that said you know there was no work in Germany you know, Germany was just devastated and uh huh. you know, Carl, come on, you know, he sent him a letter saying, you need to come here, they need your skills badly, and so he came, you know, his wife died, so he's like, I have nothing, so he started in Vermont, and then he died 10 years later in Buffalo, in actually a, like a veterans hospital, they're saying, we don't know what's killing all these veterans, but he died of it, you know, so probably it was, you know, something like PTSD plus, I'm assuming now, I've read a study on where Shockwaves from explosions. You know, mm-hmm. your yeah. brain is like jello, and actually, it's like damaging in in your other organs. So anyway, I'm just mm-hmm. like, well, okay, he had enough. And plus, being in those trenches, all those guys, you know, all sides were in horrible. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever read about it. it was I don't go into it, but it was dreadful. So uh, wow. anyway, that's something. Yeah, I would like you got to write a book. To. That's next. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> I know. I know. I got about Mark, ten thousand projects here. <laughs> I'm uh, ready. Right? Like, if, they're not getting done. <laughs> uh, well, you, you've, you've been you've been you know put in in quarantine like the rest of us. <laughs> At least we're not alone in this. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. I wish it was a different you know setup where we could actually all meet each other and you know sit fun. with your 
hard and do that. I know. Uh, you know, but one day they'll let us out to play again, and yes. um, boy, are we going to play. <laughs> Run around <laughs> like crazy people. But everyone, again, Mark's website is markspangenbergfineart.com. He's also on Facebook, and it's S-P-A-N-G-E-N-B-E-R-G, Spangenberg, and um, I'm just doing it to prove I can spell. Yeah. But thank Mark you, Spangenberg everyone. Mark Spangenberg Fine Art, yeah, he, is a Facebook. He, yeah. Oh. And Facebook, and uh, you'll see his art. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, we want to thank the National Parks Arts Foundation for sponsoring today's show. Uh, awesome, awesome organization where artists uh, can stay for a month in a national park like Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, Gettysburg, a National Military Park, uh, Dry Tortugas out in Florida Keys on your own island, Chaco cool. up in northern New Mexico. So check them out at nationalparksartsfoundation.org. And we want to thank everyone for joining us. You can keep up with us on our shows at BigBlendRadio.com. Everyone, have a happy rest of your Friday. We'll see you on Sunday for our Big Blend community show. And champagne will be poured. Yes, it will. Yes. <laughs> All right. And it will be break. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much, Marky. Take care. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.